All right, I think we're ready to get started here. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first in Sutron series of best practice webinars. As all of you know, today we'll be discussing the different methods for water level monitoring. Next slide, please. Topics will include types of sites, types of sensors, pros and cons of each, the best way to use each, and then we'll answer some of your questions. I'll be recording your questions and submitting them to our panel at the end of the presentation. Please feel free to type any questions into the chat box. Uh, on our panel today, we have a combined 38 years, years experience between Gary Baker and Paul DeLisi. Uh, Gary has over 19 years experience in the industry and has been involved with all the types of scenarios that we presented here today. Gary Sutron's business development manager, and just to note, all the contact details will also be available at the end of the presentation. We also have Paul DeLisi, Sutron's customer service director. Paul has personally dealt with product repairs and upgrades, which have given him over 18 years of hands-on experience with the systems and sensors that will be described today. And with that, I'll hand the presentation over to Gary Baker. Thanks, Joe. One of the reasons that we chose to speak on this topic is as we've talked about at Sutron, we've talked about how people will often ask us whether in meetings in their office where they'll call up and ask questions such as, what's the best way to measure water level in a particular site or you know, more of a general type question. And the, an the answer is always, it really just depends on your site and it depends on the characteristics of your site. There absolutely is a best way to do it, but it's not that general. It really just depends on what your site has, what kind of area can we install, and uh, what what the, what's the water like, and so forth. So that being said, we're going to first establish by talking about you know um, different types of sites, such as reservoirs and lakes, rivers, small streams and creeks, the difference in clean water and a high silt or sediment type site situation, dry, flashy river beds. Um, generally, those two go together. Icy conditions. What's the best type of sensor to put into an icy condition? Groundwater and irrigation. So that being said, let's talk first just about lakes and, and reservoirs. These generally can be relatively easy um, to measure. In some cases, we have to get further down. Our range is greater than certainly a small stream or creek. And so we have to take into effect um, uh, you know, the, the water changing over an entire year and what kind of change we're going to get in depth and, and take that into consideration when we're, when we're thinking about installation. But generally speaking, we have great places to install sensors or install a gauge house. In this particular site, I, I put a picture in here of Flaming Gorge Reservoir, and I put a picture at the bottom of that with uh, um, a dam. Of, of, and this is actually the same site with the dam of Flaming Gorge Reservoir, and below it, the, the Green River. In this particular site, there is a gauge just right by that river site where this picture is taken, and there's also a gauge up at the top of the dam measuring the reservoir. We're going to make reference to this again in the future, but because in some cases there are different sensors that you can select that would be good for both of these sites and actually using the same type of sensor. Our next slide shows the different types of rivers that you can measure and creeks on the next slide. But on this particular slide on the left, you'll see a small river, very clean, not running very fast. You have a structure there where you can mount something, a non-contact sensor to it. You have areas where you can uh, install a, a gauge on the side of the river. makes it very simple and, and pretty easy for that particular site. The, the, uh, the picture on the right is a picture of the Mississippi River. And this can vary, as many of you know, depending on where you are on the Mississippi River, whether in the north or in the south. Certainly in the north, you're going to deal with uh, icy conditions, um, perhaps blocks of ice coming down later in the year. Um, in this particular picture, you'll see also a bridge giving us the opportunity to um, mount sensors on the bridge or on the banks of the river. Our next picture, our next slide, actually so shows some small streams and creeks the picture on the left is a stilling well and a, a small little stream. However, this stream can get raging a little bit more in the spring when we're getting runoff. Um, 
this site also has a GOES antenna for, for telemetry, shooting the data off to the, to the GOES satellite. This, the picture on the right, just a little small little creek uh, at, a, at a weather station. Um, you can see this, this you're probably never going to have a great deal of water flowing. Um, I, I assume in some situations you might, but this, this is going to be a relatively easy site to, uh, to measure. In the next site, you see the difference between something that, that can be uh, very silty, high in sediment on the left. Um, this site probably goes dry as well as runs much higher than this. Um, so we want to be careful what type of sensor we put into to, uh, this water. We want to be selective and look at all of our options. Where's the best place to mount a, a, a gauging station if, if that's required? So forth, especially if this runs really high during runoff or during a big storm event. The picture on the right um, is a very clean site, um, certainly a nice area to uh, mount a gauging station off the banks. Certainly don't have to worry about high silt and so forth. So this, this is going to be a much easier to, to measure. Paul now is going to talk about some different types of sites from here. Thank you, Gary. Yes, uh, this, this slide here shows on the left side a very dry channel, uh, which uh, uh, has very low flow, or zero flow, it looks like in this case. And on the right side, you have a flashy uh, channel. This, in some cases, uh, this is not exactly the same site, but it could be. Uh, the dry site on a, on a big rain event could become flashy all of a sudden, so you have to pick the sensor that you uh, want to choose uh, for this station uh, with a lot of caution. You don't want to choose something that uh, is going to get ripped out by debris flowing downstream or uh, something like that. Uh, so choosing the right sensor for this uh, station is very important. Uh, the same thing can be true in, in an icy condition where, uh, you know, in the spring when the ice starts to break, uh, you have large chunks of ice uh, up in the northern states and in Canada uh, in other locations where uh, if you have a sensor uh, that is sitting out in the water, uh, it is susceptible to, to be getting ripped out by, the, by ice or, or debris or something like that. So again, choosing the right sensor is uh, critical for, for uh, this station as well as just about any other station. Uh, here we're looking at uh, some groundwater uh, stations. Uh, in groundwater, uh, you can use a shaft and pillar. We have seen that in some locations, but uh, it requires the, uh, a certain type of, uh, of, of a groundwater well where it's wide enough to fit the uh, uh, the equipment uh, down into the into the well, uh, but most often you're going to use uh, for groundwater stations they use uh, uh, pressure transducers or PTs, and they just drop them down the hole and uh, very simple installation. Um, and uh, that's usually what's used in groundwater. Uh, this picture shows on the left uh, an irrigation channel out west. Uh, the farmers uh, draw water out of the irrigation channels, and in in many of the states uh, require them to monitor how much water they're pulling out of the channel, and they charge them based on that. Uh, and what they use is, uh, in the center, you have a, a plume. A plume is uh, something that fits inside the channel. It channels all the water through this structure, and this structure is, uh, is, is a known size, known dimensions, and what you can do is you can measure the uh, level in, inside the plume uh, to get uh, what they're really after, which is the amount of flow that is going through there and uh, the, the rate that the water is being discharged through there. Uh, and that's what a plume does. It, uh, it controls the water uh, through a certain uh, part of the channel. And on the right side, you have a weir, which sort of works similar to the way a plume works. This is a a weir is essentially a, a man-made waterfall uh, that uh, uh, is channeled by the, on this picture here, you see some walls that are channeling the stream over it. Uh, and again, the, the goal here is to get the amount of water or the discharge over uh, this, uh, this structure. And uh, given that it is a, a known size and a known shape, we use a certain equation that uh, just requires the, uh, the depth of the water over that uh, structure and you can get uh, 
from that you can get the amount of uh, discharge going past that point. Uh, so we're going to talk in the, in, in the coming slides over a number of about a number of different types of sensors that can be used uh, and are used in the industry. And uh, all of these sensors, or at least most of these sensors, uh, meet uh, must meet the uh, USGS standard for accuracy, which is one hundredth of a foot, um, and that is generally the the standard that is taken in most, uh, at least domestically, most uh, organizations use uh, for the standard for accuracy. So Gary is going to talk to us a little bit about bubblers uh, from this point. So. Thanks, Paul. So as Paul said, we're going to now talk about, we, we, we reviewed some different types of sites. Now we're going to go over and review uh, of those five different sensor types, which which one of these may uh, apply best to these types of sites that we've talked about? What are some of the uh, disadvantages and advantages? This picture right here is a stilling well. And in most cases in a stilling well, uh, you'll see shaft encoders mounted in these. The next picture kind of gives you an idea of how these uh, shaft encoders work inside of a stilling well. You see the body of water on the right side of this picture with the intakes in the bottom of that. The intakes simply um, take the water in from the channel into the well itself. And so as the water increases or decreases, so does the water inside the stilling well. And using a shaft encoder, a shaft encoder works on the basis of having a shaft out the box and, and then you're putting a pulley on that. And hanging from the pulley is a weight and a float where the float now rests on top of the water. And as the water increases, um, the, the pulley turns and, and, and increases the number or decreases based on what the water level is doing. So this is a great way to get data. Um, it's pretty simple and so forth. It really works nice if you already have a stilling well out there. The next slide um, shows a couple of different stilling wells actually um, out there. Also, we're going to talk about when to use a, a, a shaft encoder in a stilling well. But the bottom right picture, I like this. This is a, an old picture of, a, of an old USGS stilling well. What's interesting about that is the picture now in the middle um, bottom is a picture of a stilling well that's being put out in today's environment um, in, called, in the state of Colorado. <clears throat> the picture on the um, left is um, inside this enclosure, you'll see that there is the hole where the uh, shaft encoder rests over the hole, and then the float and the counterweight would uh, be inside that well, hanging inside that hole. When, when do we use a shaft encoder? Um, whenever there's a stilling well, if you have a stilling well that exists and you want to keep it out there, um, uh, a shaft encoder is probably the best way to go. The equipment cost is relatively low compared to some of the other things that we're going to talk about. Um, it works nice in a surface water application. Um, and in some cases, there are some water districts that are using shaft encoders also for groundwater uh, applications. The next slide, uh, we've written down some general advantages and disadvantages to using a shaft encoder. The advantages are you just get great data. They, they're very accurate. They give you great data, um, especially if your float never gets hung up or anything in the well. It just, it, they really give you nice data. It's easy, simple technology, so therefore it makes it easy to troubleshoot. If you understand that the, um, everything just works off the shaft turning, um, it makes it really nice and easy to troubleshoot. The equipment itself uh, draws very little current, and so you don't have to worry too much about um, power, at least with the sensor itself. And again, the, the equipment itself can be very inexpensive. Some of the disadvantages to using a shaft encoder or even a stilling well is the fact that those intakes not only take in water, but in the, uh, certain events they may also take in uh, silt and debris and so forth, which can uh, make your data, data a little more erroneous. Um, and you do have to maintain that, which can include climbing in there and, and cleaning those things out, which can also be unsafe. Installing a stilling well can be pricey and expensive and sometimes difficult with permits and so forth based on where you, uh, where you live. 
icy situations. Paul talked about icy situations um, when we were talking about different sites. The problem with a stilling well in an icy situation is your float can rest just on the top of the, of the ice. Um, and then as water moves underneath the surface of the ice, um, you're, you're not going to really measure the change there. So um, to, again, depending on the site, we might want to look at some alternative um, sensors. Uh, public image, in some cases a stilling well can be a bit of an eyesore on the side of a road or you know, out in the public, and so it's not quite as easy to hide from the public. Next, Paul's going to talk about pressure transducers and, and when we may or may not use those. Yes, the, uh, the pressure transducers is uh, another type of sensor that is uh, used in uh, measuring the stage or the water level. And uh, um, what the pressure trans transducers do is they essentially have a very uh, sensitive uh, trans uh, sensor inside that measures the weight of the water above it and converts that to, uh, to a stage or, or water level. Um, I mentioned that uh, they, they're not often used in, uh, in uh, surface water, but they are in some, some cases. Here's a, a graphic example of a, of a gauging station up on the bank, and, uh, and, the, and the submersible is actually uh, uh, out in the channel of water, and the cable is obviously buried uh, in conduit uh, under the bank. And as you can, might imagine here, uh, this, uh, if, if this station is prone to icing or, or, or large debris coming down, that may not be the best solution for this station. As, as you can see, that very well could get ripped out. Uh, by, by ice or debris or something. So choosing, choosing a submersible, make sure that, uh, that you know what, uh, what's going to be coming down the stream. More often, uh, they're used, uh, pressure transducers are used in groundwater applications where you have a, uh, a, a tube, essentially a, a pipe going down into the aquifer and it's, uh, it's very simple to drop a uh, pressure transducer uh, down into this uh, this tube into the aquifer and and you get very good uh, data uh, from the pressure transducer in this way they're they're uh, cost effective the the sensor themselves are are not that expensive compared to some of the other solutions we are are talking about and they're and they're quick and easy to deploy now there are a, a number of different types of pressure transducers I'll talk about uh, briefly here there's the absolute type of pressure transducer. Uh, this absolute pressure transducer is, is basically a, a, a transducer that measures the pressure up against it. And if it's submerged in water, it's measuring the weight of the water, but it is also uh, measuring the, the barometric pressure as well as the, uh, the, air, the, air, uh, the weight of the air does, uh, does affect that. So to get actual water level readings, you have to have a, a barometer at the surface and subtract off the barometric pressure for each of you. The readings, so uh, uh, those can be used. In uh, I've seen those where the the, the absolute pressure transducer is, is dropped down a uh, the uh, the pipe and uh, and basically left for a month or so, and then they come back up and pull the thing up. And the, these type of pressure transducers have built-in loggers, and they they grab the data out. Um, and uh, of course, that is not real time in the some of the uh, organizations are, are going towards getting real-time uh, data from their groundwater wells. And uh, another so solution for that uh, is uh, you can use another type of uh, pressure transducer, which is a differential. A differential pressure transducer also measures the weight of the water, but on the reverse side of that uh, transducer, it has another port that is measuring a reference uh, pressure. Uh, and uh, an example of a differential is a, is a gauge pressure sensor over to the right. And that reference pressure is basically vented to the atmosphere. So this type of gauge uh, pressure transducer uh, has a cable coming up to the surface with not only the electronic cables uh, coming through it, but also a vent tube that is vented to the atmosphere. And the sensor, uh, as, it, as it makes a measurement, it, Vents, it, it vents and essentially subtracts off the barometric pressure and you get your, the pressure that equals the weight of the water and is, is then converted into water level, which is what you're looking for. 
So some of the advantages and disadvantages of pressure transducers are the technology has been around for a while. These have been used for a number of years and made by a number of different manufacturers. And uh, uh, the troubleshooting them, there's not much to troubleshoot uh, on a pressure transducer. Uh, if it's working, they, they usually do a good job. Uh, uh, there, are, there are things that they are prone to, and we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, uh, they're easy to install. As you saw the, uh, the picture, you could just drop, the, drop one of those down an existing uh, groundwater well, and uh, installation is not that complicated. Uh, low power, they, 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 they're not much of a, a current hog, so you're, you can, uh, depending on what kind of uh, communications you have, you can get away with a, a smaller battery and, and uh, you don't spend much time replacing batteries and solar panels. And again, the cost is relatively low uh, compared to some of the other sensors, but as you can see in the general, in the disadvantages, uh, one of the disadvantages uh, is that uh, as we've seen over the period of years, I, I'm in repair, so I know that uh, uh, you Generally, if you get five years uh, out of a pressure transducer, that's 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 good. You may get a little bit more than that, but uh, uh, some of the other sensors, uh, bubblers and the others, you should get. We we we've, we've seen those 15 years old and still going. So um, another disadvantage of a pressure transducer is you have your your sensor uh, mounted into the water. Uh, as you saw from that one picture, prone to anything coming down the stream uh, in the surface water uh, environment. Of course, you don't have that issue in, in groundwater. Uh, Paul, you mentioned shorter lifespan. Do you find that um, that a, a pressure transducer will last longer in a groundwater application than than a surface water application? Uh, yeah, yeah, that is typically the case. Uh, but, uh, you can protect them a lot better. They don't have the uh, uh, another thing that can affect them is is uh, they are sensitive devices, so they, they, they need to be mounted and uh, affixed to something because you can't have it banging around or it will affect it, uh, its calibration and, and, and uh, it, you won't get much of a lifespan out of it if it's not uh, uh, mounted properly and securely. But yes, in, in groundwater, uh, they, they do tend to last uh, quite a bit, uh, uh, you have a better lifespan out of that. Um, so in a surface water application, we should probably look at other alternatives. Yeah, that, that mo in most cases, yes. I have I have installed these in in surface water conditions, but uh, uh, it, uh, again, in most cases, it is not the best option. Okay. Uh, they they do work as long as they're submerged in uh, uh, below the surface of of, uh, of ice, but. Uh, but uh, they don't work very well when they get iced over. They, you can damage the sensor that, again, is a sensitive device. Um, again, we mentioned the potential damage of floating debris and ice. Uh, you can imagine that. Uh, they are susceptible to lightning. Uh, grounding uh, is very important, uh, as with all your sites, but especially so uh, when you have your electronics sitting in the water. Um, so Gary's going to talk to us now about uh, Another type of sensor, the bubbler sensor, which uh, many. Thanks, Paul. Uh, this is just a picture of a site um, the, at the Snake River, right below uh, Jackson Lake up in Teton National Park. We're going to talk a little bit more about bubblers, and our next slide talks just a little bit. It reviews some of the history of bubblers and the methodology and how it works. And our uh, far left picture, in the far left bottom corner, you see an orifice line in the water giving us an idea of how this works. The orifice line is releasing a bubble into the, uh, into the column of water, and in this case, a, a little river or uh, a creek of some sort. Um, you'll see up in the gauge house where the uh, orifice line starts in our picture, it, it's generated, um, at least back in the day, it was generated by a gas cylinder <clears throat> and a uh, Conifold system which regulated um, the gas flow. And then the pressure sensor back then was called a manometer, uh, mercury manometer, uh, was measuring the amount of pressure it, it, it took or was required to maintain a bubble rate out in the water. You see the picture in the middle 
is, a, is an actual picture of the same equipment. You see the, the gas cylinder, the picture of the manometer, uh, and then, of course, the data recorder there as well. The picture over in the far right uh, is, is what we currently use today that replaces all of that equipment. The, the one box in the top of that enclosure, the top right of that enclosure, actually replaces the, the gas cylinder, the manometer, the recorder. So it, re it actually replaces all of that. The, the only other box in there is you see a ghost transmitter as well that communicates with that that allows it to shoot off the data to the ghost satellite. So you can see that we've come a long way. But it, this, this technology has been used for a long time. It's very accurate. It's very simple to um, understand and install in most applications. Our next slide shows, that, shows some of the different bubblers that are available on the market. And, and we don't want to talk too much about specific bubblers other than, than just some of the different options and, and how they've evolved and come about. The, the top on the left is a simple bubbler called the AccuBubble. <clears throat> and this particular bubbler doesn't have a data logger on it um, or a keypad display. Um, it still uh, has a tank and a pressure sensor, um, gives you good measurements and so forth, but, but this will require a data logger uh, to be connected with it. Um, the, the bubbler on the far right um, top is a constant flow bubbler that does have a, uh, a data logger, a keypad, and display. This also has a desiccator built inside of it, much like the bubbler on the top left side. Where the compact bubbler on the bottom left is much smaller. You can see the dimensions. It's much smaller. Uh, it also has the desiccator or the desiccant um, outside the box. Uh, which allows us to get it much smaller. It also has a data logger, um, a keypad and display and so forth, also allowing you to connect other sensors to it as well. The bubbler on the bottom right is our dual orifice bubbler. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. It's a little bit bigger, but it's bigger for a reason. It, it allows you to measure two different spots with the one bubbler. Our next slide um, shows you uh, an installation of an orifice line. In most cases, the orifice line is installed inside of a conduit that's, that's uh, buried in the ground. You can see in this drawing that you have a conduit going from the top of the ground surface, uh, generally into a, a, a gauge house of some sort, and then uh, terminating out into the surface of the water, or out into the, to the channel of water, I should say. In this particular case, it's mounted by a concrete block. Um, you want to make sure that when you install these, that they're um, secured very well. If, if you have movement in the water, then of course your data will, uh, will be erroneous. You certainly won't have good, accurate data if, if uh, your, your orifice line is moving out into the water. The next slide shows what it looks like when it's terminated out in the water. You see the black tubing in the middle. That would be your orifice line down the conduit, down the middle of the conduit. You also have an orifice cap that um, connects onto your conduit, and then the orifice line terminates into that cap through that copper fitting. Um, again, allowing this um, orifice line to be protected from debris and so forth. If you get any sort of leak in that line, um, that will certainly disrupt your data and the quality of it. Our next slide <clears throat> gives some um, pictures of actual orifice line installations. The slide on the left, you can see the conduit going in the water. It's not completely installed yet, but you can see um, in the middle of the installation, you have the, uh, the, the enclosure um, there, and then uh, preparing for the orifice line to come down and go through the conduit. Another site in the middle, you can see the trench being run where the conduit would run down from that into the, into the body of water. The picture on the far right is, is, a, is the actual same site, actually the same site from a different angle, and the uh, conduit running into uh, your water there. You can see it's a nice, uh, nice body of water, nice and calm, uh, giving us a good area to do a good measurement. And again, the orifice line would be running right down the middle of that conduit. <coughs> This is the uh, dual orifice bubbler. Well, we said it's a little bit bigger, but you can see on the right picture why it's bigger. You have two different tanks in there with the one compressor. 
And with each tank, you would have an, um, uh, an exclusive uh, orifice line going to um, a different spot or a different site for a different measurement. You could do it that way, or you could use it for uh, density. Let's talk about it. Uh, you'll see the bullet points. that you, you can have your two different orifice lines for two dedicated water level readings. So much like the site we talked about at the beginning, the Flaming Gorge Reservoir, you could actually have a, a, uh, an orifice line measuring the reservoir, and then you can have an orifice line going down into the river down below, all being recorded off the same bubbler, which is very unique. And uh, I don't know that there's any competition for this type of, of application. You could also get a density calculation using uh, fixed known vertical orifices. So in other words, if, if you have two orifice lines in the body of water and you have known distances by getting measurements off each one of those and knowing the distance of it, you can calculate density with the bubbler. You can also get a salinity calculation uh, with, by knowing the density and then adding a temp sensor to that, you can calculate salinity. You can also, with this bubbler, calculate uh, sedimentation by knowing the density and the salinity together and then giving you a sedimentation uh, measurement. So again, very unique with this bubbler. So it, it, it really is a nice option. Our next picture talks about when to use a bubbler. Certainly in a lot of these uh, surface water applications, you can see the picture on the right, a nice USGS uh, bubbler gauging site where uh, they selected just a little uh, spot on the bank of the river and installed an orifice line uh, out into that uh, body of water. Pretty simple installation. Um, so again, a nice uh, surface water application. A uh, bubbler is nice when you don't have a structure. If you have a structure of some sort, of course, a, a non-contact sensor is a nice option for there. But Paul's going to talk about that here in just a moment. If you don't have a stilling well, uh, a bubbler is a nice option. Again, if we already had a stilling well mounted out here and we wanted to keep it, then perhaps we'd use a shaft encoder. Uh, we've talked about flashy sites. Flashy sites are difficult with, with probably any type of sensor, but a bubbler works well with them. Again, because in most cases, a flashy site can also be a dry riverbed a lot of times of the year particularly out in, say, the southwest and in other parts of the world where it's really dry and then it can, uh, when, it, when it rains, we have an event, it can really rage down that body of water, that channel. Uh, a bubbler works well when it's dry. It just, uh, you know, you, you bubble out into the dry air and then when water comes over the orifice line, you will increase the pressure in your tank and increase the bubble rate and, and it will continue to give you good data throughout. We've talked about cold water and icy conditions or cold weather and icy conditions. A bubbler works pretty well in those conditions as well. Again, there's probably nothing as perfect for iced over uh, sites. But at least with a bubbler, you can get underneath the ice and, and get a good measurement underneath that ice surface when the water is still um, melted underneath. So some general advantages and disadvantages with bubblers. Um, they're great data. You get great data from these. They're very accurate from almost any location. Almost all of those different types of sites that we talked about in the beginning, a bubbler works great for virtually all of those. Electronics are out of the water. So as Paul mentioned, when you put a pressure transducer in the water, you're risking its life and so forth. And you're limiting it, rather. Um, here you're keeping the electronics out of the water. Your life of your bubbler is going to be much longer. Easy to install in most cases. Um, and we've already talked about no effects of drying sites. In some cases with other types of sensors, if they're getting dry and then wet and then dry and wet, um, it, it can affect the electronics over the life of the sensor. Um, you, you have little effect with dirty water. We talked about the high silt sediment sites in the beginning. Uh, the bubbler can do purging and so forth that, that will um, continually do preventive maintenance and keeping the bubbler or the orifice line clean of silt and sediment. You have little loss in extreme uh, events. If you do lose equipment down the river, if it's a flashy uh, high event, high water event, you don't lose your electronics, you would simply lose your orifice line. 
Um, and then Paul talked about lightning. Uh, bubblers are less susceptible to lightning. You have all your equipment in the gauge house and, and you're only running your opus line outside of it. Some of the disadvantages, I mean, you just can, um, there are some cases when you can get obstruction on your opus line. Um, a lot of us have seen sites where you can get several feet of sediment over your orifice line. Purging is not going to take care of uh, several feet of sediment. You can also get boulders and so forth over that, um, which is which is which can affect your your orifice line, affect your data. But certainly, you're going to have those scenarios, regardless of what you have in the water. If you put a pressure transducer in the water and you have a couple feet of sediment, you're going to have a problem there as well. One of the problems as well with bubblers in the past has been if, if stage changes rapidly, sometimes the bubbler struggles to keep up with it. The constant flow bubbler, however, has a feature in it called the fast track mode that Paul is going to address. Yes, those, those of you who are more experienced uh, with, uh, with measuring water and have dealt with bubblers for years probably know that uh, they do not track uh, rapid changes uh, very uh, real time. Uh, they usually lag when the, the water level is either rising or falling uh, rapidly. When the water level is falling rapidly, uh, you have excess pressure in the tank, and it can only be dissipated as fast as your bubble rate. So if you're bubbling at 90 bubbles per minute or 60 bubbles per minute, depending on how fast the water is falling, it can, it can lag and take some time to equalize. Uh, the opposite is true when it is rising quick. You have insufficient pressure in the tank and, uh, and it uh, takes a while, it can take a while for the, for the bubbler to uh, catch up and uh, increase the pressure inside the tank such that uh, it gives you good measurements compared to the, the actual level. Um, what the, the constant flow bubbler does that Sutron makes is we have some internal uh, sensors that monitor the pressure of the internal tank and monitor the pressure inside uh, a manifold that's in there. And we also have a, a, a pressure relief valve in there. And, and through some software, uh, uh, we can uh, detect when the water level is changing rapidly and, and monitor these sensors and increase the uh, the pump and uh, turn the pump on when the when the when the pressure in the tube uh, in the tank is insufficient, and when the pressure in the tank is too great, uh, and uh, when the water level is ri is dropping rapidly, we uh, purge off some by opening the check valve. So, uh, in this in, with this new uh, uh, fast track mode, uh, you get pretty much real time measurement uh, of your water data with a bubbler, which has uh, always been a tricky thing uh, in the past for anybody who uh, who has experience with bubblers uh, and rapid changing in water level uh, probably already knows this uh, this phenomenon. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk about uh, radar sensors. Uh, there's been a, a push for uh, non-contact sensors, uh, especially by the USGS and uh, and the radar level, radar sensor is uh, is the answer to that. The, the radar sensor sits uh, on some structure. It's mounted to a structure. In this case, you see it mounted to a wall uh, with an arm going out, and uh, and the uh, sensor is meant to, uh, is mounted such that it is pointed down perpendicular to the surface of the water, um, and it uh, it works great uh, in a in a site that uh, uh, that. Uh, has a structure such as this or a bridge. A bridge is an excellent choice uh, to, to mount this to, and we'll uh, show an example of that in, in a second. But the way that the way a radar sensor works is the radar sensor actually measures the distance to the water, and, and once that is known, the uh, the user uh, then punches in the stage into the into the unit, into the logger, or into the radar sensor. In this case, uh, our, the Sutron radar sensors have built-in loggers. So in this case, you punch it right into the, the, the radar sensor itself, the, the stage, and from that point forward, it knows the, uh, since it knows the stage and knows the distance to the water, uh, it knows the, the total distance to the bottom of your channel. And from that point, it can track the, the water level just by uh, tracking the changes in the distance uh, to the surface. Um, what the radar 
all the radars out there have a protrude a, a beam uh, that uh, that extends and it gets uh, wider uh, the, the higher up the uh, the sensor is mounted. Uh, uh, so you uh, so you need a certain uh, clear distance depending on the height uh, uh, that you're mounting it uh, above the surface. You you the the, the radius uh, increases and. Uh, and you need to make sure that you have a clear view of the water. It doesn't do very well when it bounces off the rocks or the or the bank of a of a of a stream or a channel. So you have to have sufficient uh, area there that it can uh, monitor the surface of the water accurately. Because what happens is the radar sensor uh, emits a, a pulse, uh, uh, and it uh, whatever is reflected back at the sensor is uh, that's how it gets its reading. So uh, bouncing off of the, the water surface is, is obviously what you want. If it's bouncing off of the, uh, something else, then you're going to get erroneous readings. Uh, in this uh, in this example here, we show you uh, where where would be a good and a bad place to install the sensor. Over to the right, you see uh, a bad a bad choice here because there are rocks and uh, down below, and, and it looks like if the the water level got a little bit lower, you'd really be in trouble uh, to uh, get the bad measurements there. Uh, on the left side, uh, this picture shows it looks like it's got a good open area um, to, to monitor the changes in water level. Uh, in this pr particular choice, uh, the, uh, the, the left side here would be a much better site for the installation. Um, when to use a radar? Um, uh, if you have an existing uh, structure there uh, that makes it easy to mount and uh, uh, do, do a quick installation, it can save you a lot of uh, a lot of money just in the just in, in the installation. If you just uh, you don't need to do any digging, you don't need uh, any construction equipment. Uh, if you have an existing structure, if you do need to build a structure, and I have seen that done before. Uh, where they actually build a, a cantilever arm out over the water, that, that can be a kind of expensive. Uh, so uh, in most cases, you're, you're mounting it to an existing structure uh, where that is possible. Uh, obviously, they're, they're good for surface water applications only. Uh, the, the beam uh, is not, uh, maybe in the future, they will, uh, the technology will improve and the and when the beam width gets smaller, they may be able to be used in groundwater wells. But at this point, uh, they're pretty much limited to a surface water application. And as I mentioned, at the right location, it can be a quick, simple uh, installation. So some of the advantages are that uh, it fills the need from the USGS for a non-contact uh, uh, level sensor. Uh, again, the technology has been around for a while. The radar technology is just now being implemented to the, for this purpose of reading water level, but uh, uh, the distance technology there has been around for a while. Uh, troubleshooting uh, is, is pretty easy. The main thing that can go wrong with these is, uh, is uh, usually de deals with the installation. It needs to be mounted properly. It needs to be uh, a perpendicular uh, uh, position to the water surface so that uh, the beam bounces off, uh, off of it directly in, uh, and you get good measurements. Um, they aren't, they're not affected by dirty water. We're just measuring the surface of the water. We don't really, uh, not concerned about what's floating underneath the water. As long as we're hitting the surface of the water, we're in good, good shape there. They do not work very well for uh, icy conditions. Uh, if it bounces off the ice surface, uh, the, the beam can go anywhere, and it may not very, very well be reflected back at the, at the sensor. So does not work very good when there's ice or debris floating in the, in the channel below. You do need a stable structure. Uh, you don't want something that's going to be moving. Uh, that's going to affect your reading. To the extent that a bridge vibrates, uh, you, can, uh, you can mitigate that issue by uh, averaging out. The, the, our sensor by default average, makes a 10 second average to reading. So vibrations are pretty well averaged out. If a, if a bridge uh, expands and uh, contracts over time due to weather or, or whatever, and, and they better do that or they're, they're going to fall eventually. So the, the, it's a good thing that they do. Uh, but that, that is usually over a period of time. And, and uh, to, uh, to compensate for that, you go out there periodically and reset the, 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 
the stage and it, and it corrects for that. But that's not something that happens quickly. It happens over a period of time. And of course, the last point here is vandalism. Obviously, with a with a nice looking white uh, object hanging out over the water, they make a good target for somebody with a mindset uh, to do some vandalism. So, um, Paul, I Paul, I've noticed that in in your pictures here of the radars that they're they're uh, installed and mounted out into the environment without enclosures or anything to protect them. Is that okay? Can they can they withstand the weather, the rain, the snow, wind? Yeah, yes. This case is sealed. Uh, that the case of this. Uh, the, the, by the way, the uh, the actual uh, uh, radar sensor has an antenna. It's a cone antenna, and it's all within that uh, that structure there. And it uh, it sits in there. That's a sealed case. These are, these are tested uh, at, at at the factory to, from minus 40 Celsius to plus 60 Celsius, and uh, and uh, uh, they are sealed such that they they can withstand the change. And uh, the only thing that uh, really affect them are, are are vibrations and changes in movement in the uh, in the structure, which uh, you want to try to avoid there. Good. Um, so Gary's going to talk to us about another type of sensor called the acoustic Doppler, which is used in uh, some some places. So in the interest of time, we're not going to spend a bunch of time on acoustic Doppler sensors, but acoustic Doppler current profilers are, are actually a good way of measuring your velocity out in the channel and calculating discharge. Definitely a, a, a nice option if, if that's what the ultimate goal is. Some of the advantages and disadvantages um, to these. <clears throat> that Again, the advantage is you're going to get real-time discharge data. The ADCPs measure the absolute speed of the water. So you, you know, you're going to get the actual data that you want. Um, the disadvantages to an ADCP that they can be kind of costly um, compared to the other options that we spoke about already. This is going to be your most expensive um, option here. In a lot of cases, some of those different sites that we've talked about, they probably won't apply to some of those. For instance, uh, an icy condition. It works great underneath the surface of the, of the ice and actually can still measure velocity and, and calculate discharge below the surface of the ice. But these also try to measure the surface of the water and the top of the water. And when you have ice up there, it, it can disrupt that measurement and, and, and uh, give you some erroneous data there. Flashy sites are really similar. Uh, again, uh, you're going to have some of the same issues that Paul talked about with pressure transducers, that as things may come rolling down your, your site and the high water event, it can certainly damage your sensor or take it down uh, with everything else. And it's a very costly, expensive piece of equipment. However, you can get good data in the water through a high event, but it's also looking for the surface of the water. And, and uh, Paul had a picture earlier of just a, a really high um, event with big waves on the water. Um, an ADCP can struggle with that as well. And so you just want to be careful, again, what type of product that you select and what type of instrument that you select for uh, what site um, scenario and situation that you're dealing with. Paul's going to uh, summarize things up, and then we're going to take a few questions. Yes, as, as we mentioned, uh, the goal of this uh, uh, webinar was to uh, introduce you to some of the different types of sites. and hopefully you match the, the type of site up with, uh, with the best choice for, for the sensor for that site. Uh, there isn't a, there's no perfect solution for every site, but there is a best solution. Uh, as you can see, the bubbler it can be used in just about every, uh, every type of site. It may not be the best answer for every site. Uh, if you have an existing structure, uh, maybe the radar sensor may be the better, better choice for it. But then again, then again, the radar uh, requires you to have uh, sufficient surface area over the water to uh, to always get good readings. Uh, the other types of sensors have uh, also have uh, certain limitations at certain sites, uh, certain types of sites, uh, and this sort this graphic here sort of just uh, summarizes that. Um, so hopefully we've brought you some uh, information that will help you uh, 
to go, go towards uh, deciding what sensor to use at, at a particular location. So uh, from that, I'm going to take, give it back to Joe, and he's going to see if we have any questions uh, from, the, from the visitors. All right, thanks, Paul. Uh, we've got a lot of questions here. If we don't get to your question, I promise we'll follow up with you, uh, but we'll go ahead and start here. So our first question is from Jim Navarro. Do you require a PT sensor additionally to any of these bubblers, or do they include it already? Yeah, there. All of these bubblers that we spoke about have have pressure transducers um, have integrated as part of the system. There are bubblers on the market that do not uh, have sensors built inside of them, but the ones that we've talked about do. So uh, when shopping around, you just want to make sure that they do. These particular ones, all made by Sutron, do. Okay, great. Next question is from Mike Sattel. What is the lowest cost method of measuring shallow groundwater if accuracy is not a high concern? Paul, you want that one or you want me to take it? Well, I, I, I still think the uh, submersible is, uh, is the, uh, uh, the best choice uh, for groundwater in almost all situations. Um, uh, you can get them in different ranges. Uh, if it's uh, if it's a low uh, a low level under there, you know, you can get one as low as five psi, and, uh, and that's going to measure uh, approximately about up to about 12, 12 feet change in water level. And again, as long as the submersible stays below the the lowest point, you can measure any depth with that. So you just need to get it below the uh, the lowest point. Uh, they do uh, come in higher uh, ranges. That doesn't normally change the price uh, of a sensor. Um, they, usually the, the 5 PSI is about the same price as a 30 PSI uh, sensor. So, but just oh, look, look. the... I'm sorry, go ahead. Just the, uh, the savings in, in installation alone. Some of the, uh, some of the other sensors, maybe a shaft encoder costs less, but the installation of a shaft encoder may add up to to an overall higher cost than, than some of the other choices. Like a yeah, that, that's, that's a great comment. I would just say, too, there's, there's a number of manufacturers for pressure transducers, and, and some, are not look, some are not as accurate as others. And of course, the more accurate you, you like, the, the more expensive you're, it's going to be. So if accuracy is not, is not as important to you, again, you, there's you're going to pay a little bit less. All right, next question is from Rob Nelson. Do you sell the mounting kit shown in slide 35? And he's referring to the New Orleans wall mount arm. Uh, since, because sites are all uh, so much different, we, we have a, a, a department here that uh, specializes in projects and building the right type of mount for the right type of uh, station. I, I, normally, when we've done one before, it becomes not necessarily a standard product, but something within our arsenal that we can reproduce. So I would say since that is an existing one, we can easily reproduce that. I, I wouldn't say that it, that particular one is, is on a, a price list somewhere, but uh, if we've done it before, uh, we can obviously reproduce it, given the, right, given the uh, a similar uh, uh, installation uh, site. All right, next question is from Jim Navarro. How do radars behave in turbulent or wavy surface waters? That's a good question. Um, that can be an issue. Um, um, they, they, uh, they typically can, can, uh, can be problematic in that situation, but what, uh, one way to, to protect against that is, is that the averaging, I think I talked about it, uh, you can average the uh, make the sensor make a measurement that is, uh, by, by default, it, it makes a 10-second measurement. You can increase that number within the, by sending command to the sensor to, if it's if extremely turbulent, if you average that, increase that average out a little bit, or it can go con considerably higher if you need to, that often will, uh, will mitigate that, uh, that issue. To the extent that the, the, uh, uh, 
the beam uh, bounces around in that situation can be an issue too, but uh, generally, again, that averaging helps you out uh, with that uh, by getting uh, more time to, uh, to, add, to see that uh, radar beam bouncing back off the surface and, and averaging out the, the changes. Paul and Joe, let, let me just add to that as well. First of all, it, you know, with a lot of these uh, sensors we've talked about, you, you can have issues with, with all of these in, in a lot of these uh, difficult situations with high wind and high waves and so forth. I will say with radars, um, you know, Paul's right, you can, you can average some of these things out and so forth by extending your measurement time. I will say that, that you're bouncing, you're getting a reflection off the surface of the water. If the surface of the water has high standing waves, you have peaks and then you have troughs. And generally speaking, you're going to get a better reflection off the trough than you are the, the peak of the water. And so if you're off at all, even when you're averaging, you could be a little bit low through high winds. But we're talking about high, you know, extreme windy conditions. And we're not talking about, our low is, we're not talking about more than 100 or so. I mean, it's minimal. But, but these are different scenarios that you have to be aware of. Would you agree with that, Paul? Yeah, sure. That uh, that was a good explanation. There's uh, two more questions here about the radar, which I think are related, so I'll ask them together. What is the distance a radar unit can read to the water surface, and are radar readings affected by heavy rain when sensor are mounted in high bridges? Okay. I'll take the first part of that. The, uh, the Sutron... Uh, radar sensor that we make uh, at this point is uh, uh, has a limitation of uh, 60 feet above the water surface. Uh, this is something we're working on and uh, as time goes by we'll, uh, we'll have products that, that, that increase that. But due to the uh, due to the power that we're allowed to use within these sensors and the shape of the, the antenna built within that thing, uh, uh, the, uh, the radar beam uh, gets uh, wider, uh, obviously, uh, the higher it, uh, it sets and, the, and, the, and the, uh, the beam is weaker, the farther it goes. So uh, the measurements are accurate up to uh, 60 feet. Beyond that, uh, they start to, start to lose accuracy. And that's where, that's where they're calibrated uh, for is up to 60 feet. Uh, in the future, we, were, we will have them that go much higher than that. But, uh, uh, and there may be other manufacturers that increase that. Uh, to some extent, um, I'm not uh, I'm not aware of what others' uh, limitations are, but, uh, but they may uh, have a little bit more of a, of a distance that, uh, that that they are capable of. Joe, what was the other part of that question? High uh, high uh, rain, heavy rain. Yes, our radars are affected by heavy rain when they're mounted on high bridges. Yeah, not 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 really. I mean, you're not going to get a good reflection back on rain. It's, it's noise. It, you won't see that. All right. Wouldn't uh, be something that, that you should be concerned with. I think we've got time for one more question. And uh, which sensors work best in salt environments? Well, again, it depends on the actual site. Uh, bubblers work very good in salt water. Uh, now, there is, uh, it, it, you may need to do a different calculation depending, because salt water has a different density. And we measure the pressure of the weight of the water above a, uh, a sensor, a, a pressure transducer or, an, or a bubbler. Or, uh, we measure the weight of the water. Now, the weight of salt water is different than the weight of uh, fresh water. I don't. It depends on the depth there, but uh, it, it may be uh, something that that is minimal. But it, it may be that you have to uh, account for the, the density of the water uh, in there. But uh, generally speaking, I would uh, I prefer a, a bubbler in that situation. I, although we have uh, customers who are using all sorts of sensors. Uh, in uh, salt water, they, they're using I see shaft encoders used in, in salt water applications, which is certainly uh, something that, that can be used. Uh, there's another type of sensor that uh, uh, that we did not e even talk about, but it's a sonic type of sensor, 
that uh, that basically puts out a low uh, a low sonic pulse and, and essentially works similar to a radar and, and that it bounces off the surface and and uh, I see those used by uh, uh, NOAA a lot in their uh, in their um, uh, stations uh, that are monitoring tides. Well, what's interesting, Paul? I, I love the question because because it, it goes back to the original reason that, that we created this webinar is that in, even in an ocean situation, is there a best sensor? Well, perhaps, but again, a radar is is often used and works very well. A bubbler is often used for tide studies and works very well. A shaft encoder can work very well. In a lot of cases, it really just depends on the site. What, what do you have in terms of how can I mount this and, and where am I going to get my best mounting and, and installation? So it, it, it's kind of an interesting question. It's an interesting full circle to where we began. Um, but all three of those would work well. A pressure transducer would probably be your least um, you know, used in, this, in a situation like that. All right. I think we've reached the end of our time here for the webinar. I'm getting a lot of questions about if this presentation is going to be made available later on. We have made a recording of this and we'll make it um, available to all the participants. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank everyone for joining our webinar today. Uh, we have a series of best practice webinars planned. If you really enjoy the content uh, that you saw here today, please sign up for our next webinar, which will be covering the different types of telemetry. Thank you again for joining us. The organizer has 